As we learned in the last section, um, non-homeostatic appetite can override homeostatic appetite to promote higher levels of feeding, uh, especially in individuals with obesity, but not just in individuals with obesity. And we talked about the prefrontal cortex and its role in executive uh, function and how that can be compromised. And we also talked about the hippocampus and how that can affect feeding behavior and also how that can be compromised in individuals with obesity. But in this section, I want to specifically look at the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. And in particular, when you hear this term, think of the term reward. So think of the rewarding value of certain behaviors, including feeding, okay? So like it says here, we can be conditioned to find certain foods or eating behaviors more rewarding. And this mesolimbic dopamine, whenever you see DA, think dopamine circuit, combined with inputs from various cortical limbic and thalambic. So think cortical limbic, think like emotional, but also we're talking about the cortex too, so executive function. Thalamic, think sensations, perception of um, sensory inputs. Um, so in a, combined with inputs from various cortical limbic and thalamic afferents, modulate rewarding and conditioned properties of feedings that can often override homeostatic signals. Okay, so this mesolimbic reward pathway, which is also getting information about uh, sensory information plus prefrontal cortex in information too, this can, like I said, override those homeostatic nutrient sensing, energy sensing pathways to promote higher feeding and in individuals with obesity, higher weight as well. Why this picture here, again, we see this mid-sagittal view of the brain, is that there's um, various pathways that kind of we see dopamine move along. <laughs> um, but there's two main areas that are often implicated in this reward pathway, and, and that is the ventral tegmental area as well as the nucleus accumbens. The VTA is this kind of initiation more of this dopaminergic um, release that can go to project to different parts of the brain, but in particular projects to the nucleus accumbens. Although there is also dopamine pathways into the frontal cortex and into the striatum as well, okay? But I'll, um, I'll focus mostly our discussion on the VTA, the nucleus accumbens. We're actually gonna talk about the um, amygdala as well, which is also involved in this um, reward pathway, okay? So our main focus is gonna be on dopamine, although opioids and serotonin also have uh, implications for the reward circuitry that drives hedonic eating. We're going to talk briefly about cannabinoids as well, but really we're going to focus our uh, conversation on uh, dopamine, okay? So here's where it gets interesting. You've probably heard of dopamine and you've heard about it being the pleasure hormone, okay? It's the, the pleasure guy, okay? Um, newer evidence suggests that dopamine isn't so much about like how much we enjoy things, how much we like things, the pleasure something brings us, it's more involved in the process before that. And it's more involved in the wanting of things as opposed to the liking of things. So for instance, a good example of this is someone that um, maybe has a drug uh, dependency and they're like, oh my gosh, I want the drug, I want the drug, I want the drug, I want the drug, dopamine. And then they get high and they're like, fuck, I wish I wasn't high. They don't even like it, but they wanted it. There was like this driving, like, oh my gosh, I need to get it. And that we believe that wanting of a particular reward is more driven by dopamine than the liking of it, okay? So I'm gonna use these terms a lot, wanting versus liking, and they are not necessarily the same thing. And we now believe that dopamine is more implicated in the wanting than the liking. And I'm gonna provide some evidence to support that, okay? So some evidence to suggest that dopamine is more is not necessarily about liking is that when we measure, when we look at hedonic liking, it actually is not compromised by massive dopamine loss. Okay, so if there's less dopamine in the striatum, for instance, you would expect less liking if it is the liking uh, neurotransmitter. Okay, but it doesn't seem to impact that. 
okay? Also, if we administer a lot of uh, extra dopamine to mice, exogenous dopamine to mice, not humans, we don't do this in humans, we actually see that it, again, does not change their liking of something, although we see a lot more wanting. So, okay, if a lot of these studies are happening in mice, and we're measuring wanting in mice, and I'll show you how we measure wanting in a bit, or one of the ways we measure wanting in a bit. How do you measure liking? How do you know if a mouse likes something? We can't ask him <laughs> or her. So what they do, it's really interesting, they put like these like, so think of like a mouse protocol, experimental protocol box, okay? And maybe in some of the ones we're gonna see, they're like little levers that they push or pull to get a particular reward. But what they do, in some experimental protocols is they put a little like camera under the area where the mouse is under that box okay usually around the place where they get the reward and they look at the mouse's changes in its oral facial expressions okay and what they found is that mice have similar responses oral facial responses that are what we see like in newborns in infants when they like something or dislike something. So think of a baby liking something versus a baby disliking something, okay, some sort of food. So if the baby likes something, it's gonna, right? There's like, might not smile, <laughs> but it has more of that like licking its lips, you know, um, response. Whereas if a baby doesn't like something, we see this in primates as well, it has more of this like, that face uh, and like <laughs> think about babies they make that face too when they don't like something and and they they kind of do like there's like a, an aversion to it and mice actually sometimes like put their hands up too <laughs> like this way you can kind of see him he's like trying to push it away okay so rhythmic tongue protrusions like uh, gapes head shakes pushing food away, that's how we know a mouse dislikes things. Super interesting. Anyways, okay? But that's going to become important when we look at this study and some other ones as well, okay? So these are this is different studies that are shown on this particular slide, um, but it again shows how um, dopamine specifically can promote higher wanting, but not necessarily higher liking, okay? So for instance, this experimental protocol right here we're looking at DAT knockout mice. So DAT, DAT knockout mice, they're missing the dopamine T, the dopamine transporter, a dopamine transporter. Um, accordingly, they have higher levels of dopamine. They're hyper, hyper dopaminergic, quite a mouthful mice, okay? So the DAT knockout mice, they are gonna be represented with this black dot. Okay, so one of the ways we can me measure wanting is how hard the mouse will work for a particular reward. How many times they push a particular lever, for instance, in order to get a particular reward. And these hyperdopaminergic mice worked harder. If I look down here to this one, again, the darker uh, parts are the DAT knockout mice, so hyperdopaminergic uh, mice. After they have been exposed to a goal and several sessions later when they've kind of learned, once they know that there's a reward attached to a particular um, effort, okay, they actually work so much harder and they complete tasks faster. Okay, they actually, they, they even like get out of the gate, like sometimes when they have like little mouse gates <laughs> to start an experiment, when that gate opens, the hyperdopaminergic mice, they like rush out. They're like, give me, you know, give me the reward, give me the reward, okay? And they figure it out much more quickly, okay? They complete tasks that much more quickly when there's a reward attached to it, okay? However, when there is not that reward attached to it, we don't see them learning any faster, okay? Uh, they learn uh, a, an instrumental bar press task no faster than wild type mice, but this, this again has nothing to do with a reward. So when a reward is attached, they work so much harder, okay? However, even though these mice are like, <laughs> they're working so much harder, they're like, give me the reward, give me the reward, give me the reward, these hyperdopaminergic ones, they don't necessarily like what they get any more 
than those mice that are wild type that don't have that excessive dopamine okay so when i look so these bars the difference in the bar colors represents the trial like how many times they they tried that and when i look at the dat knockout mouse overall their positive reactions were not higher in fact they were a little bit lower and sig with a significant difference especially in in the the higher uh, sucrose reward their hedonic i like this responses even though they worked harder for it they didn't like it anymore and conversely the number of averse reactions was about the same between the hyperdopaminergic and the wild type okay so these two in particular show that mice work harder and learn faster when there's a reward attached if they have higher dopamines but if they have higher dopamine that doesn't necessarily mean they like things anymore again showing the difference between wanting versus liking and dopamine being more implicated in wanting so a natural um, experiment that we can look at is with respect to uh, patients with Parkinson's disease okay so in Parkinson's disease one of the main things we see is the deterioration of do dopamine secreting neurons okay however if dopamine was promoting liking and individuals with Parkinson's have less dopamine you would expect them people with less dopamine to like certain responses certain things less okay however people with Parkinson's and people without Parkinson's that have been studied show similar subjective pleasure rankings to sweet foods okay as their controls so they don't seem to like pleasurable foods less or more for that matter okay and again if dopamine was promoting liking you would expect them to like these particular foods more okay however when uh, these Parkinson patients took uh, basically exogenous dopamine something called L-dopa their wanting effect went up their desire for a particular reward and for the particular drug in this case okay went up okay so for instance to the question do you want to consume do you want to take more of what you consumed right now individuals that had high, had taken that exogenous dopamine had higher rankings according to this okay however when they asked these people do you like the effects there was kind of no big difference okay so these are the results of that same kind of same study okay so on the y-axis what it, the y-axis mostly rec uh, represents is the magnitude of dopamine release in the NAC and the nucleus accumbens okay so the more dopamine that was released the more they wanted actually that same drug okay the more they said wanted do you want to take more of what you consumed right now they ranked it higher the more dopamine released however when we ask them do you like the effects of how you feel it want versus like okay their ranking of how much they liked a drug didn't correlate with how much dopamine okay it's kind of all over the place whereas here we see more of a correlation okay it's not one-to-one -one, but it's a lot more correlated than liking again what we're showing here is that dopamine is more involved in wanting versus liking how does this relate to food consumption individuals with obesity might have higher activation in this reward pathway that's most of all mediated by dopamine and that might make them have higher food seeking behavior than individuals even if they don't even like that food that much right might have higher food seeking behavior compared to people with normal dopamine and reward signal reward signaling okay another example to support this is from studies of of individuals with binge eating disorder which we'll learn about in a in a following unit okay individuals with binge eating disorder tend to show higher dopamine and just a brief 
overview of binge eating disorder. It's a disorder that involves, it's a type of eating disorder that involves a lot of food seeking behavior and uncontrolled uh, eating, where individuals typically eat a lot in a short period of time. Okay, and what we're arguing here is that that maybe that food seeking behavior is at least in part mediated by dopamine. Okay, because we find, and it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but we do find a slight correlation between uh, the amount of dopamine, okay, higher dopamine levels, that's what the y-axis represents, so higher levels of dopamine were, were at least partly correlated with higher binge eating scale uh, scores, okay, so Again, showing that dopamine might be implicated in this higher wanting that we see in individuals with binge eating. And I'll tell you, as someone that has uh, de dealt with binge eating disorder um, for many years, um, that I couldn't explain to you why I would be seeking food as hard as I was seeking food. And I can tell you that when I was eating that food, I wasn't even like liking it. I just like I needed, I needed to get it. It's such an interesting thing, and part of the mechanism might be related to dopamine and its strong impacts on wanting. That's one of the main concepts we're going over, okay? So, what have we learned so far? Dopamine is involved in reward, but more associated with wanting than liking, okay? Wanting can be evidenced in the absence of liking, okay? Why, but why this wanting of food reward might be per, more pronounced towards some food, um, might be due to to conditioned responses. This basically indicates is that we can be conditioned to find certain foods more rewarding or certain nutrients more rewarding, and we might seek those out more so. Okay, and this isn't just in the reward pathway. This isn't just the nucleus accumbens and the VTA. Okay, of course, there's other parts of the brain like the central amygdala, like the hippocampus like the prefrontal cortex that are all involved in this process of deciding, you know, what foods do I want the most <laughs> and what foods do I want l less? And again, that can all lead into the level of food seeking behavior we see in individuals and that might be higher in individuals with obesity.